A very good evening to all of you and a very happy new year as well. I hope all of you have made a great start to 2021. I certainly have and I hope uh, it's the same for all of you. Uh, anyways, welcome to the 51st session of Centa's webinar series for teachers. Uh, today's session, as we all know, is going to focus on quite a unique theme, storytelling, more specifically impactful storytelling and how it could become a tool for effective teaching learning. I I can hear a bit, bit of an echo, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I, think I, it, I think it's muted. Great. Yeah. Uh, the session is, as you all know, is going to be facilitated by Ms. Bandan Preet Mahajan. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, uh, a very quick introduction to uh, uh, Ms. Bandan. Uh, she's an alumnus of Holy Child School and Miranda House. She is a first division major in economics, who has had the proud privilege of being in the field of education and coaching for the last 20 years working in various leadership, coaching and teaching positions, such as being the academic head of a reputed school in West Delhi, to being an assistant professor of economics at several prestigious institutes like the Trinity Institute of Professional Studies and the All India Institute of Local Government. She is the founder of Genius Editorial as well. She has also had the opportunity of delivering her training modules and keynote addresses at several forums and has been uh, on the panel discussions and webinars on esteemed platforms. Uh, her expositions have been featured 11 times on All India Radio's worldwide service, which is in English. She is an internationally certified public speaking coach and has been running Genius Communication Skills, Life Skills and Personality Development Unit for the past 20 years. She is a certified storyteller, of course, and a certified voiceover artist as well. She is also a youth skill mentor and several modules have been delivered by her across the globe for professionals, executives, students, teachers, entrepreneurs and leaders. Not only that, she has been an editor and proofreader to several coffee table books, magazines, college newsletters, and journals. And lest I forget, she is also a winner of Centa TPO 2019. Uh, wonderful to have you uh, with us, uh, ma'am. Uh, looking forward to, really, really looking forward to this session because this is very different from what we have done thus far in the last 50 sessions. So all of us are looking forward to the session. I can see 366 people have already joined us and more oh, are going yeah. to join us uh, during during the course of the session. Uh, before you start, uh, just a quick announcement for those who uh, are joining us for the first time. Uh, all of you will get a certificate of participation for the session. Uh, for, and uh, please listen carefully because for, for that, you will have to fill in the feedback form. Uh, I'll share a feedback form in the live chat section and also on my center uh, towards the end of the session in around 45 minutes from now. Uh, please fill that in and your participation record will be made available on your my center account by noon tomorrow. So please make sure that you fill that session in. Now, uh, I mean, we've jumped to 462 in a second, so I hope the number is going to be pleased. So that's, 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 it, uh, that's it from my side, ma'am. Over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Karthik, for that introduction thank you so much once again for inviting me over as a facilitator for today's session and uh, greetings of the hour to the entire educator fraternity that we have here with us this evening and uh, before i start and uh, actually move into the main topic for the evening i would just like to say that today i have a key for all of you confused surprised perplexed now this key is actually an acronym k standing for knowledge E standing for empowers and Y standing for you. So knowledge empowers you. So that's going to be the main theme of this uh, session and exp exposition. Now we are all educators and we have been doing great at our jobs. We've done a job, I think, which is no less than a frontline warrior during this great pause period, as I like to call it or refer to it, the lockdown period as, is, as it is normally called. But I think this was a period when we educators actually never paused. Rather, we kept working tirelessly, relentlessly, 24-7 for our students while constantly trying to upgrade, upskill, and upscale ourselves. And it was indeed imperative. Now, you may ask me why. So before I actually dwell in my, into my topic, into my PowerPoint presentation for the day, let me narrate a story to you first. OK, so once upon a time, there was this woodcutter, and he was looking for a job. He was desperately looking for a job, and he went to a timber merchant. Now, the timber merchant looked at him. His physique was pretty good. He looked hardworking and he showed a lot of promise and he was actually quite in dire need of a job. So he decided to give him this job of cutting trees. Now, the pay was pretty good, as I mentioned. The working conditions was, were very good and even the woodcutter was very happy. The timber merchant offered him an axe to cut trees. Now, the very first day, he was all pepped up. He was all motivated and he went ahead and cut 21 trees. 
he was very happy his boss was very happy so obviously he appreciated him a lot and then he was motivated yet again and next day he worked even harder but much to his surprise and dismay this time he was able to cut down only 17 trees third day he thought okay maybe yesterday was a bad day today i'll work even harder but again to his disappointment this time the number fell down to 10 initially he thought probably his strength is going down daily on a daily basis probably his level of strength is going down and that's the reason why he's not really being efficient in his work so he went to the woodcut uh, to the timber merchant and he apologized to him and it was then that the uh, timber merchant actually came up with a question which made him res- retrospect what was that question that question was my dear friend when was the last time that you actually sharpened your axe it was then that the woodcutter realized oh my god i was so busy cutting the trees all the time that I, that i actually never find found time to you know sharpen my axe so this is exactly what we as educators need to keep doing that's exactly what i said you need to keep upskilling upscaling and upgrading yourself this is the time to try another acronym for you people try as in t for time to r as in reinvent and y as in yourself so this is the time to reinvent yourself another way of looking at it, at the story could be uh, suppose you are asked to cut a tree for example and you are given a hammer to cut it down now hammer isn't a right tool to cut it right so even if you have the hammer and you keep trying probably you might as well take 30 days to cut down that tree isn't it so now if the same person is given a, an axe which is a proper tool a proper skill i would uh, make an analogy here so if he has given an axe the same task of 30 days can actually be cut down to 30 minutes so the difference between the 30 days and 30 minutes is actually what is the difference of being upskilled that's the importance of skills so it is indeed imperative that we continuously keep honing our skills and i think senta as a platform is doing a great job in providing us this opportunity to share our learnings our experiences our skills so that we as educators always keep abreast of the times and we can continue without any obstruction with our cause of empowering masses and transforming lives So with that I would like to move on to the pertinent topic of today's session and which is the title the theme of today's powerpoint presentation and that is storytelling as a tool of effective teaching learning. So um Karthik can I start with my PPT? Uh yes ma'am it's it's been added to your uh, Yeah so yeah. yeah. So as you can see here this is our title for today impactful storytelling as a tool for effective teaching learning. Let's move on to the next slide. Why do we love stories? That's the very first question that comes to mind. Why is it that we all love stories, be it of any age group, be it of any gender? What is it that makes us love stories? I think, as far as I'm concerned, I find stories ice. Now you may be surprised. What is she saying? I mean, ice ki tarah thandi lagti hai, ya ice ki tarah dry lagti hai. So it's not that. Since I'm a communication skills coach, I like to play with words. So another acronym for you people today. I think stories are I for interesting and inspiring, C for connecting and creative, E for enriching and engaging. Isn't it cool? So definitely I find so stories so very well connect to my head, heart and soul. Why? Because they help us to show our joys and sorrows and at the same time they touch our emotions. Emotions like sympathy, happiness, courage, empathy, love. There are so many emotions around us, right? so it creates it help it helps us to create that edge to edge connect now what is edge to edge that human to human connect that heart to heart connect so let's humanize our teaching learning not only in classroom classrooms but even beyond our classrooms so i think stories are unique and create a lasting impact not just this again they help us to ensure that our evms are intact now you may again ask me what is evm so i think they help us to ensure that our ethics our values our morals they are well intact so it's all about feelings values and which in turn impact our social behavior so you can see feelings as in like compassion kindness generosity these are just a few examples that i've taken up but there are n number of feelings values human connect uh, the ethics the morals that these stories touch upon and which in turn impact social behavior 
And uh, with this, I would now like to move on to our first main topic of uh, today's presentation, which is the science behind storytelling. Now, why is it? I mean, it's a scientific study. There are so many psychological studies, scientific studies, which have actually gone to prove that stories really do matter. They are really engaging. They are really effective. And for a teacher like us, they are indeed something which is a win-win situation. You know, the time has come when we as teachers, we do not need to be something like a sage on the stage, but we need to be a guide by the side for our students. And storytelling can actually come very useful to you with reference to this. So when you hear a relatable story, the first thing that happens is that it releases oxytocin, which is a feel-good hormone. So what happens thereafter? Thereafter, as you can see, it helps boost trust, compassion, empathy. It helps us and motivates us to work better and more effectively with others. In our case, it will be our students. And it positively influences social behavior. And let me share a secret with you. If you use storytelling in your classrooms, you are bound to have a huge amount of fan base for yourself in class. OK, so having said this, let's move ahead further with the science behind storytelling. And let's see what the neurophysicists or the neuroscientists have to say about this. Now, in this particular slide, you can see two laterally inverted uh, images of the brain, the human brain. Now, why I have put them simultaneously like this, so one brain depicts the listener's brain and the other brain depicts the storyteller's brain. And as you can clearly make out from, from the slide itself, you can see that when a story is narrated, the same portions in both the brains light up. So what happens is the listener and storyteller are both on the same page sharing the same web wavelength. And that's exactly what we want from our students in class that they should listen to us attentively, which way they will do only when they are on the same wavelength as we are as educators. So exactly the same areas of the brain of both the storyteller and the listener light up upon an MRI, which is the magnetic resonance imaging. And on listening to a good story, your brain reacts as if you're actually experiencing it yourself. In simple terms, your brain places you inside the story itself. As a matter of fact, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that with stories in hand, you actually go ahead and become a leader with IIT. That is, you have the ability to influence, you have the ability to inspire, and you obviously have the ability to teach your students effectively, efficaciously. Now, uh, when, my, when I talk of students, uh, there are so uh, if I were to say what are the different kinds of learners that we come across, so there are three, primarily three kinds of learners that we get to see. 40% of them are visual learners. Now, what do visual, visual learners, what does this terminology actually mean? Now, these are the kind of children who would, you know, react more, understand more when they are exposed to videos, diagrams, and illustrations. Another 40% is what we call the auditory learners. So these are the uh, learners who would respond more and would be able to recall the facts more when they are exposed to lectures and, uh, and discussions. So they are the ones who listen. They are good listeners. And the third category, the 20%, is those of kinesthetic learners. They are the ones who learn better when they're actually made to do certain things, be it exper experimentation, performing some kind of an activity, going through some kinds of an experience or feeling. And this again leads me to another of my favorite acronyms for V from visual, A from auditory, and K for kinesthetic. I think stories have something for everyone, the entire WAC community of students. How? Let's see this in the next slide. So as you can see here, the WAC community, which is the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic community of learners that we have in our classrooms, I think the visual learners will go ahead and appreciate the mental picture that each storytelling story episode will evoke. We will come to this in greater detail in a slide later on. For auditory ones, they appreciate the words and voice of the storyteller. That's the reason why we say that the kinds of words you use, the kind of dramatization you use, the kind of voice modulation you use is very, very important. And again, I will go into greater depth as far as this is also concerned. Now, moving on to the kinesthetic learners, they appreciate the emotional connections and the feelings that are woven into the story. Now, uh, I think, as I just mentioned some time back, this is a win-win situation for you. And you know what? The icing on the cake now. 
Psychologist Jerome Bruner's research has actually gone ahead and proven that facts are 20 times more likely to be remembered if they are a part of the story. Interesting, isn't it? So obviously that's the story of our, uh, you know, that's the power of our stories. And that's exactly the next slide that I have here for you. Let's understand what is the power of stories. Although I think the picture here itself is, you know, explicitly showing and trying to reflect how powerful, how effective can stories be. So let's talk of the first thing here. So when I say, uh, imagine a flower or imagine a face. So some kind of a visual pattern is, you know, evoked by your brain, something like this, as I can uh, show it here, as I've shown in the slide. So maybe a flower or a face like this. Now, what happens as far as stories are concerned? Similarly, stories are recognizable patterns. And in those patterns, we tend to find meaning. We use stories to make sense of our own world and share that understanding with others. As a matter of fact, this is so interesting that we have powerful impulses that, you know, go on to detect a story pattern even when there is none. And I can prove it using this next slide. Now, as you can see here, uh, I have, you know, drawn uh, two triangles, one a smaller one, one the bigger one. Then there is a circle and then uh, there is this rectangle towards the side of the slide. Now, this is not a random uh, diagram set of diagrams that I'm showing you. This is actually a part of the study that was conducted on 34 Massachusetts college students in 1944. The only difference was that while I am not able to show you the, uh, you know, the entire set of figures moving, for these students, they were shown like a movie. The triangles, the circle were moving while the rectangle was stationary. Now, the surprising element here was that when the students were asked to tell what could they see on the screen, only one student out of those 34 students said that he was able to see some geometrical figures. And what did the rest of them say? Who's to know about this? So a few of the students actually went ahead and said uh, that perhaps there are two um, men who are fighting with each other. So they were referring to these two moving triangles on the screen. And they were saying that the smaller one is probably the uh, young, innocent guy who is being bullied by this uh, bigger man who, who is that is reflected by the bigger triangle. And this bully is blinded by rage and frustration. Uh, a few of them said that probably the circle is like a worried woman. And she's trying to escape the rage and, you know, frustration of this uh, bigger man, uh, which is depicted by the bigger triangle. And uh, a lot of people said the rectangle is like a silent or a mute spectator. Now, that's the, uh, you know, power of stories. So what happened as a conclusion of the study was that the researcher got to understand that we human beings tend to attach feelings to even inanimate objects, inanimate shapes, as is the case here. Now, I am a big Bollywood buff, so I cannot, uh, none of my presentations can go without a slide on uh, Bollywood. So this is my take on Bollywood. My take to this particular slide is, as you can see, the first picture. Uh, this picture reflects uh, Rithik Roshan and his character from the movie Fresh. I think I'm sure when we all went to watch this movie and we came out of the theater hall, uh, when we saw this entire movie showing Rithik Roshan as the savior of the world, didn't we experience a feeling of dominance when we came out of the theater? Second case, let's talk of he's fighting the, you know, we all get goosebumps while we watch the movie. While we come out of the huge sense of the feeling of patriotism that we experience, even though part of it and that's what happens the third one as you can all see and guess by now is Akshay Kumar and this is from the movie gold wherein he earns gold for his country with a lot of effort of uh, you know his own self and his team members and obviously this made us experience a whole lot of feeling of this is the story you know how connections can be made through stories the edge to edge connect that Move on to our next slide if I were to talk about a very simple diagram, you have a few talking characters in the story. Then there is a conflict. So you may have a protagonist, an antagonist. They may have a conflict of interest. And finally, which uh, makes us reach the conclusion, uh, you know, first the climax, and then finally reach a conclusion uh, wherein which 
the conflict that was there, the problem that was there seems resolved. So uh, this is a very, very simple diagram and which discusses the three elements of storytelling. Another way of looking at it is, you could have, uh, you know, how does a story proceed? So first we have to have a setting. Now for a movie like Dangal, we had a rural background. I mean, the same movie wouldn't have had the same impact if it, it would have been set up in a professional corporate kind of a background. It wouldn't make sense. Setting is very important. Then we have T, talking characters. And then, oops, a problem. So obviously there's a conflict. And then resolution attempts. And last, yes, problem solved. So that's our concluding part. So these are the essentials of the story from my point of view. This going back to history or going back in time, I refer to Aristotle's seven elements of storytelling, which are quite similar. He talks about dialogues. We will discuss about this. We, he talks about decor, which is about, again, the setting context. He talks about melody. So we will be discussing an element of sing song cadence. I have an example ready for you on this. The spectacle, theme, plot, character. So we'll be discussing all these in greater details. Another caricature, another sketch, as you can see here, I find it very interesting. So we start off from an exposition point of view. And please see the graph that is going along with it. So the exposition starts from a relatively low point here. And we are trying to make a setting or give a context to our story, then followed by some inciting incident, the rising action. Now this fury dragon is showing the crisis part of it, the conflict part of it. You reach the climax and the denouement wherein you overcome that conflict, you resolve the conflict. And finally, he's singing away back to his home, singing in all glory, just implying the fact that he has resolved the problem. OK, now the second part of our exposition for the evening, and that is storytelling as an effective teaching strategy. Now, before I move ahead with this, I would like to take up uh, you know, an example. So let us assume that there are two math teachers and another one teaching class 60. Both of them are teaching about multiplication of fractions. And uh, they have put across a problem on the board 6A blackboard and 6B blackboard. One of them is using storytelling. And the other one is using. Uh, Ma'am, uh, sorry to step in. Yeah. There's a bit of a disturbance. Uh, I mean, the voice is not coming across in a stable manner. So it's, it's just going a little bit in and out. So uh, it's happened a couple of times. So could you just check for that? Is it okay? Yeah, it's 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 better now. Yeah. So um, I'll start off with this portion once again. Storytelling as an effective teaching strategy. So as I was just mentioning, let us assume that there are two teachers, one a, a class six A and another one a class six B. Both of them are willing to take up this concept of multiplication of fractions. So uh, the teacher in class 6A goes ahead and writes down the problem, but she uses storytelling as an effective medium for her teaching strategy. The other teacher in class 6B just goes down and you know writes down this problem in the normal sense of things. So I want you to you know kind of go with uh, go over the slide with me and try to understand how the two of these look different and which of these do you think will turn out to be more enticing more enthralling, more engaging for your students. So let's move on to the next slide. And uh, before I move on to the next slide, Kartik, I hope I'm uh, audible now so I can continue. Yes, uh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Ma. Yeah. OK, perfect. So this set of two blackboards here. Now, as I just mentioned, the teacher in class 6A, she's put down this problem. She must have discussed in the in the class first and she says there is a girl called Sia who invited all her friends for a tea party at her home and she proudly declared that my mom is the best cook in the world and bakes the best delicious cakes now if you see this is you know a context a setting that has been set up for your story all her 12 classmates waited to experience Sia's mom's baking now on the day of the tea party her mom received an urgent call and had to rush to the city 
Sia was upset. She did not want to cancel her tea party, but she did not know how to bake. Now, this is that situation called, oops, a problem, isn't it? So she had seen her mom bake cake for four in their family. She had no idea how to cook for 12 or bake for 12. So she used her own brain. Now here, this is the that particular component which talks of how to make an attempt to resolve the problem. So she used her brain and thought, four into three is 12. So maybe I shall make three cakes separately, but then that will take too long. So that means the conflict is still unresolved. Now steps in her sister. And the sister came in and said, silly Sia. Now, do you see the kind of dialogue that the teacher is using here is somewhat similar to the kind of dialogue that two siblings would share in real life. So that is why I said, even the manner in which the characters talk, the dialogues that they use are equally important if you really want to keep your students engaged. So the dialogue here is, silly Sia, you don't need to make three cakes. All you need to do is multiply each recipe ingredient by three, and you get your measurements for 12 people cake. So problem solved. And this is the way she puts across this problem on multiplication of fractions for her. Uh, I think this is not uh, fractions here, but in general, uh, if we do have fractions here, we can go ahead and do the multiplication part of it because here we've not mentioned the number. While in class 6b, the teacher simply goes and writes this on the blackboard, solve the word problem. If one cup of flour, half cup butter, and half cup of sugar makes a cake for four, then how many cups of flour, butter, and sugar will it be required for 12 people? I'm damn sure that a whole lot of students will be able to give the right answer to the second pro the way the second problem has been mentioned. But I'm sure it will find less engagement in class than the first one. Okay. Having said that, uh, I would now like to move on to another thing from here itself in continuity as to how this is just one example of how you can create stories. But in general, what are the things that you need to keep in mind when you are devising some good stories for yourself, for your students at large? So what you can do is you can add some dramatic content. So there could be some mystery, tension, surprise, wonder. If you remember, the last story that we just discussed had an element of tension in it. Then you could use rhythmic prose. As I just said, you could use some kind of musical, musical or sing song cadence. As I said, I will take it up in a little while from now. Create some memorable characters and give those characters some goal. So here, Sia's goal was to bake a cake for her 12 friends. If you uh, realize, the one strength that Sia, that Sia depicted here was that she was very observant. She'd observed her mother baking a cake for four people. And that is the experience she used to bake the uh, you know, cake for 12 of her friends. Also try to make each and every part effective. Deepen the plot within the subplot. And as I just mentioned a little time back, make the dialogues count. In fact, that dialogue should, you know, help you to advance your story. It should not uh, make you take a detour or a digress, digression from your story. Add an immersive setting, the setting or the context. We've been discussing this. Include a conflict. Write great beginnings because uh, once the beginning is very, uh, you know, something that makes the students hook on to your story, the rest becomes easy. As they say, well begun is half done. And obviously, the last one is give satisfying endings. So how the ending actually goes ahead and resolves primary conflicts. As a matter of fact, I would like to say that rather than uh, you know uh, thinking of the ending later, you should first think of the kind of problem you're trying to solve, what is the kind of solution you're looking at, and accordingly device your story. So you have to go the other way around. So having said that, let's move on to our uh, next thing. And when you're using story, I think a lot of us uh, in India, uh, for people who are from India, they must have uh, read about the nine rasas in Hindi, or in English, I would call them the rhetoric sentiments. So you could use all these sentiments, you could use a combination of these sentiments, and you could, you know, kind of decorate or ornament your entire story, because the more the dramatization, the more the melodrama, the more the students are going to enjoy it. So you could use the Shringar Ras, Hasya Ras, Karuna Ras, Rodra Ras, Veer Ras, Bhayanak Ras, Shant Ras, Subhits Ras, and Adbhut Ras. So this is how we can go ahead with uh, our nine rhetoric sentiments. With this, let's come to something slightly more uh, you know, uh, serious. And that's about what is the importance of storytelling according to the NCF, the National Curriculum Framework 2005. So uh, I'll just give you a little brief about what they're saying as far as storytelling is concerned. I'm not going to be going into greater details about it. So the NCF 2005 of India highlights the importance of storytelling as a successful means of teaching in, uh, in schools. 
However, due to lack of requisite skills and motivation, storytelling as a medium of instruction has been ignored to quite an extent. So there is a whole lot of work that we as educators can actually do in this field. Nevertheless, a lot of teachers and schools have been successful in integrating the art of storytelling into classrooms and giving their lessons to their students. As a matter of fact, they go ahead and say that dry and tough subjects like mathematics, history, and science, they can be made more engaging by using stories. And in fact, a lot of schools have been using this technique in the form of what is called the active story based learning, which in short is called the ASDL technique. And not only does it help the students, you know, come up with their academics, but it also helps them develop their general awareness, their critical thinking and other such skills, which about which again, we're going to be discussing in a little while from now. Now, before we go ahead, I think it is very, very important to understand as to how we, we can actually go ahead and incorporate storytelling into the classroom. There are a few steps that you need to keep in mind. So the first and the most important step is plan, because as they say, you fail to plan. So you plan to fail, right? So planning is very important. Now, as far as planning is concerned, the first thing you need to do is you have to see what is your teaching strategy, what is the subject that you're going to teach, what is the age group that you're going to teach, and accordingly, you could pick a topic. Now, uh, just as we did the multiplication part of it, we can also take up a story on division. I think uh, when we were kids, and I think even till now, a whole lot of teachers are using that same story of uh, you know dividing a particular donut or dividing a particular pastry or cake into equal divisions for so many friends so that's how division was taught to us when we started off with division or fractions uh, the same thing could be taken up in biology and you could talk on a topic you could plan around hibernation photosynthesis i have uh, you know uh, an idea on both of them and i'll be sharing that too now, the second step is you have to create. Now, what do you create? We've already done the various elements that are involved in storytelling. So we need to create characters and characters which are relatable. You have to have a setting. You have to have a conflict. And uh, for example, when I'm talking of creating a story, so let's take an example here. Suppose we need to teach a child as to what are the various components of a spaceship. So we could actually engage them and tell them a story about a person who is on a, on a treasure hunt and how he keeps moving along and keeps collecting different parts. And finally, he comes up with this whole spaceship. So uh, this is one idea that I have shared with you. I'm sure there are a whole lot of creative brains out there. So you can use your brain. And yes, thanks to the internet, we have a whole lot of free resources here as well to help us create our stories. And then let's move on to the third step, and that's tell. Now, when you're telling the story, it's not just the story that you know will keep your story uh, will keep your students engaged or interested or inspired. But the manner in which you tell the story is equally important. So uh, obviously, we will use voice modulation. We will use visual media. We can use props. We can use role plays. And these are very good ways and means and techniques of telling a good, effective story. The next step is discuss and reflect. Now. I think we all have been told the story during our childhood about the ant and the grasshopper and how the grasshopper was very lazy. And uh, when he saw the ant collecting and gathering food for it itself before winters, uh, I mean, the whole scenario, that whole story is very common. And it's a classic story which all of us have, have been told. So you could use that story to bring out the concept of hibernation. At the same time, not just hibernation, I think you can even talk about the fact as to, uh, you know, you could highlight certain values which have been depicted by the character, something like perseverance, uh, something like hard work, dedication, planning, uh, and so on, which are demonstrated by the characters in the story. So this is about discussion and reflection. The next point is cross-curriculum. So when we talk of cross-curriculum, we have to ensure that there is a multidisciplinary approach that we are trying to adopt. We move across different curricula, different subjects at the same time. And this is exactly something which the NEP 2020 vision paper is also expecting us as educators to do. So what you could probably do is you could take up a story which is touching upon different subjects, such as language, social science, science, mathematics. So here you could take up a story about the creation of the world in different cultures. And this can engage the students at different levels, make them curious about the social, the scientific, and the mathematical aspects of the entire creation concept. 
the last but definitely not the least important one is create with students you have to not just engage the students even the picture shows here how the teacher is actually trying to create the stories with her students with her students right so there are different tips that you could use here so number one what you could do is uh, you could ask the students to pick up stories or you could ask the students to pick up some old stories and recreate them as new stories uh, you could keep your stories you know open ended don't let the story get over we will be discussing about this also these are actually called cliffhangers so you give a dramatic pause and you put the story to an end somewhere in mid in between and then you ask the story uh, you know the students to give alternative endings to such kinds of stories then another good idea would be to uh, bring a story book to the classroom and uh, you could have two pages torn out of that classroom or two pages missing out of that story and you could ask your students as for their perception as for what they think and uh, you could also ask students to retell the story to paraphrase the story uh, to narrate the story from the antagonist point of view rather than the hero's point of view now these are a few suggestions as to how we can create stories with our students so uh, having said this uh, i think storytelling also builds a whole lot of other skills which i have already talked about so just a quick read listening speaking skills cooperative learning creativity imagination cultural historical awareness developing multiple perspectives visual arts and obviously voice modulation uh but having said this let's move on to the next uh, important uh, you know component of our exposition for the day uh i will just share this uh, screen with you and i think uh, this particular topic is really important because i'm going to be dealing with what are the various storytelling tips for teachers and how they can capture their students attention because i think this is one scenario which we all have almost all of us have been experiencing at some point of time or the other and that's lack of interest especially in the case of online classes so how do we capture our students interest that is really really important and how do we use these storytelling tips so i have a few tips uh, you which could come in handy and let's see what we have so the first thing as i mentioned earlier also you have to have a hook in the opening itself so if you are planning to teach your students about some process about some phenomena and you want to introduce it in class and you want to you know kind of ensure that your students are interested in listening to you the very introduction itself so how do we go about it so you can see two pictures here one is about gravity the other one is about photosynthesis so what i can do here is that uh, i can create an imaginary or a hypothetical situation and i can take away the most important aspect of the process or the phenomena from the story so the first situation wherein i can ask my students what if there were a world uh, where everything that went up never came down now that's the hook for teaching gravity now similarly i could use the hook in the second case to introduce my story on photosynthesis and say what if the entire world did have plants the plants did have flowers but what if they never had green leaves so this is about the hook in your opening let's move on to the next one we could use simple analogies you know uh, there are these whole lot of complicated things that students find difficult to understand so storytelling can actually help us to create those kinds of analogies and make complicated things we can deconstruct the complicated concepts and you know create it and convert it into a nugget which is easily uh, remembered and which is easily recalled at the time when it is required to be reproduced so uh, the first uh, picture you see here is about the unity is strength story the very classic story that we all have been hearing till now so if i were to teach my students about national integration so why not start off with a story like this where we first of all talk about unity and unity is strength so i think you all know about the story the father the three sons how the father gives them a stick each to break they're able to break it and then he asks them to you know take a bundle of sticks and try to break them which they are not able to do and that's how the unity is strength story comes up this is the first thing the second analogy could be something like this which i've shown here the simple electric circuit and uh, you know this railway track that i've shown so what is the analogy between these two now uh, when i try to explain the importance of each and every component in a simple electric circuit uh, i try to describe that the train just like the train can move along only when the two tracks are actually connected to each other a broken track would mean that the train cannot move any further 
Similarly, in the electric circuit, each and every component is required. If the circuit breaks, if the circuit is not complete, then the electricity will not pass through it and the light bulb will not glow. So this is the kind of analogies that we could use in order to make it simple. The next step is obviously very simple. Maintain eye contact because stories will connect only when your eyes connect with your audiences. Because as they say, let the eyes uh, do some talking, right? Uh, the next thing that could come to our rescue is the use movement or action mode. Again, I've put up a story come poem here. And I think all of us have been through this one in the form of a nursery rhyme when we were kids. And our teachers wanted to teach us 1 to 10. And they used not just the story part of it, but even the movement and the action. So even if you tend to forget the numbers, it's the movement or the action which helps you recall whatever concept you've forgotten. So that's the whole idea. So it goes like one, two, buckle my shoe, three, four, shut the door, five, six, pick up the sticks, seven, eight, lay them straight, nine, ten, a big fat hen. So that is how our stories move. But this is a story which I've taken for the smaller kids. What about the elder ones? So we ha I have an example here for them as well. As you can clearly see here, this is a story about how uh, you know the uh, breaking of the salt law or the Dandi march actually took place? How did it start? So what I can tell my students here is that students, there are a few mistakes in the story that I'm going to narrate to you. Whenever I make a mistake, clap your hands. And whenever you clap your hands, I will tell you to correct that mistake. So having started off with the first sentence, we can have something like this. Once upon a time in 1947, the British took control of all the sugar factories. Because it's not 1947, it is 1930, it is not sugar, it is salt. Indians could no longer make their own salt. They were forced to buy it from the French. Ma'am, it's British. And believe you me, kids are really, you know, they're very happy when they're able to find fault with, you know, uh, the teacher. So this exercise is really going to, you know, connect with them a lot. So they had to pay a heavy tax. Salt was the smallest necessity of life. No, ma'am, it's not smallest. It's the greatest necessity of life, especially for the poor. So Gandhiji drew a clever plan. He told Sherwood, no, ma'am, it's Irwin, the then viceroy of his plan. He told him that if he did not accept the demands he made in a letter written to him, he would break the sugar law, salt law, and he would also encourage the other Australians to do so, Indians to do so, right? So this is uh, one way how we can incorporate action and movement into our stories to you know make storytelling even more effective. And the next one is my favorite. As I just said, uh, we will be talking about use of dramatic pauses or cliffhangers. Now, what are cliffhangers? Now, for some people who may be aware of the Sas Bahu sagas that appear on television, now what do these people do? Whenever an episode is running and they are moving towards the end of an episode, now suddenly uh, they will elevate the tension, they will elevate the conflict and just about the time when you're sitting like this, you know, waiting and watching, ki, Bhaiya, what is going to happen next? How will this end? How will this problem get resolved? They will do da 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 and it will go to be continued. It will be coming in the next episode. And that's what, you know, that's when you start thinking, yeah, what is going to happen next? I think this is going to happen. Or I think this is going to happen. So if this is the impact of cliffhangers, as far as we adults are concerned, just imagine what is the power of these cliffhangers when we take it up in our storytelling sessions in the classroom. So obviously what happens after this is that, uh, you know, the students, they will try to come up with different and alternative solutions to different problems. And how does this help us as educators? Number one, it obviously helps us save time. Number two, it helps us to give them the opportunity to brainstorm and come up with alternative solutions. And when they come up with alternative solutions themselves, believe you me, these ideas will remain embedded in their brain forever. That's the best part of it. Now, let's move on to our next tip. So we could use some real life instances or some hypothetical situations. Now, whenever, I um, mean, given the fact that we have been through a COVID situation, but in the normal course of things, it's very common in occurrence that a lot of students, 
you know, undertake uh, railway journeys during their vacation time. So once they're back from vacations, you can probably ask them about their experience, ask them to narrate the entire anecdote about the railway journey. I myself, you know, keep narrating stories from this book by Mrinal Mitra, and that's called My First Railway Journey. And uh, we can ask them, what all did you observe? And during this entire course of the story narration, you can first of all come up with the concept of air pollution. Second, uh, I think you can come up with something. Achha, bache, uh, when you were sitting in the train, how was tea and coffee being served? So if it was being served in plastic cups, so you can come up with this idea about talking on uh, how plastic is a nuisance for all of us because it's a non-biodegradable substance. And then you can ask them to, you know, come up with some viable solution, alternative solution against this. So uh, probably some student may say, okay, ma'am, we can use pullers. And then you can ask students if they've actually seen pullers being served in any of the railway journey. So these kinds of situations or the real life situations can help you take up a whole lot of concepts. Uh, then talking about hypothetical situation, is, which is the second picture on the slide. So we could create a story about the third world war uh, which will be on account of water scarcity, people fighting for water because there'll be no water on the earth or there'll be scarcity of water on the earth. And this way we can bring about the relevance of the concept of importance of water conservation. But uh, sadly enough, I really don't know. I mean, I have put it up as an example for uh, hypothetical situation. But if things go the way they are going, we never know this hypothetical situation can actually turn out to be a real life situation. So let's keep our fingers crossed that this never happens. OK, the next thing is uh, after this step, let's move on to the next step. So we can supplement our storytelling with alliteration, repetitive words or a sing song cadence. Now, I'll be taking up all three of them separately. So let's take up alliteration. Now, for those teachers uh, who primarily may not be knowing about alliteration, uh, it's a poetic device. It's a literary device that is used uh, in language. And Hindi may we call it Anupra Salankar for those teachers who are Hindi teachers here. So uh, how does it work? I'll just give you an idea. So as you can see the first sentence here, the darkest duration. Now, there are these two words. Uh, which are quite close. In fact, these are the ones which are adjacent to each other. But whenever you have a string of words or a pair of words or some words which are either adjacent or very close to each other and they start with the same initial letter, that is called alliteration. So what you can do is you can narrate a section of your story and ask the students to find out the alliteration. Now, this how does this activity work? So I'll first read out this passage to you. And what you'll find it find is that towards the end of the story, once they've done with the alliteration marking, it will become very easy for them to even memorize such questions in history. So let's go ahead with this. The darkest duration. Now, there is an alliteration here of the theory French Revolution. So theory and French that lasted between 1793 and 1794 is referred to R as the reign of terror. Again, an R. During this time, two T's here, Robespierre rightly led the National Convention. So two R's here, Convention and the Committee of Public Safety. He wanted to rule out. Now, this is the interesting part. You will get to see so many repetitions of R here. He wanted to rule out any resistance. Uh, just a minute. He wanted to rule out any resistance to revolution. So he called for a reign or rule of terror. Many of Robespierre's political rivals, like Queen Marie Antoinette, were arrested on charges of treason and executed by the guillotine. Now, if you see, there are, I think, five to six hours which are repeated here, and that makes it very interesting. And at the same time, it has a, an easier recall value. So this is how we can use alliteration, and I've used it in history. You could use it in any other subject of your choice. Uh, another one, now this is the repetitive words, and I think this finds more relevance for the smaller kids, uh, especially the kindergarten ones, because I've seen a whole lot of kindergarten teachers actually using this story. Now, the story is called Mrs. Wishy Washy's Farm, and this is written by Joy Carly. And uh, what the story is all about, first of all, let me just discuss that. So this story is about Mrs. Wishy Washy. She has a farm. She has a set of animals there. Now, in the beginning of the story, as you can see in the second picture down there, in the beginning, these animals, when uh, they are given an opportunity, they go into the mud, they have their mud splash, their mud bath, and they enjoy being colored with mud. 
and then mrs wishy washy comes out and she takes them all for a bath and they none of these people none of these animals actually like this uh, you know like to take a bath so they hate mrs wishy washy and at the same time they do not like their bath so together now there's a conflict like situation there is a clash of interest so what these animals do is in order to in an attempt to resolve the conflict they decide to leave her and go to the city when they go there they realize their mistake they realize that there is no one to take care of them and then they come back and they start loving not just mrs wishy washy but at the same time they start loving their bath as well now this is a, the story part of it now coming back to the repetitive words and what we also call the predictable text now what is the relevance here so uh, if i were to talk about this during the washing action now when she used to take her animals for washing for bathing the text continuously keeps repeating two words wishy washy wishy washy wishy washy so what happens is that children get immediately engaged and they can start you know participating in reading uh, because they can anticipate that this okay last time ma'am read this like wishy washy wishy washy wishy washy now it's again come here so they can predict and by the time they go home they can actually tell their moms mom today was my first day in school and i'm already a reader and that sense of accomplishment that sense of achievement will you know motivate this child to such an extent that the next day he would come all the more revved up for learning even more so that's the story of rep, you know that's the effectiveness or the power of repetitive words or predictable text and how we can use them so let's move on to our next slide and this one is the sing song cadence as we talked it so i would want each one of you to kindly bear with my voice because now i'm going to sing a song for you which is like a story but at the same time the story is in a sing song cadence in a sing song manner and the song was originally sung by aj jenkins and i'll try my level best to you know come up to the standard but anyways uh, the main thing is that you should be clear with what i'm trying to say here so this goes like this i am the sun i'm a burning ball of fire i am very big indeed life on earth depends on me i am the sun i am mercury i'm the closest planet to the sun i'm a ball of fire no i have no moon i am mercury i am venus i am the same size as the earth but i spin the other way and much more slowly i have no water i am venus i am the earth the place where we all live there is land and lots of sea so i look blue i have a moon i am the earth i am mars i'm a rocky red planet my mountains are the highest in our solar system i have two moons i am mars i am jupiter i am a gas giant i am the biggest and i spin the fastest i have the biggest moon i am jupiter i am uranus sorry i am saturn i am a gas giant my rings are made of ice titan is my biggest moon i am saturn i am uranus i'm an icy gas giant i'm the coldest planet in the solar system i have rings made of dust i am uranus i am neptune i'm an icy gas giant i'm the farthest planet from the sun i have many storms i am neptune we are the solar system 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 
So this is how the sing song cadence or the musical cadence can be used to aid your storytelling effort in classroom. So having said this, let's move on to our next thing, which was about voice modulation. So as I just mentioned, when you're, you know, kind of uh, enacting a story or you're telling and narrating a story to your kids, it's not just the story that is important, not just the plot that is important, not just the characters that are important, but it's very important how you voice your characters. Uh, if you indulge in a little bit of voice, voice modulation, you involve a few body gestures, you have some facial expressions, your eyes are doing the talking. So this makes a whole lot of a difference to render more impactfulness and more effectiveness to your storytelling sessions. So, uh, for example, as I can, as you can see the slide here, I have a slide uh, which is basically to do with the civil war. So if you are enacting a scene on the civil war, so what you can do here is, so when you're talking of uh, President Abraham Lincoln, so you stand tall and speak deeply when you are in the role of President Abraham Lincoln. And when you're speaking like an American slave, you could probably slouch your shoulders and you could look like an oppressed uh, slave and change your volume. So this is how voice modulation helps. Then uh, the next thing is that it's very, very important how your story goes ahead and provides answers to your problem. So that's the main thing that I wanted to tell you that before you actually go ahead and create your story, first see as to what will be the key takeaways from your story, first decide those, and then go ahead and pick your story or create your story. Uh, another important thing is that you need to appeal to the senses, all the senses of your students as far as possible. I'm not saying it will be feasible all the time, but as far as possible, try to cater to all their sensibilities, to all their senses, as we say, what is called the multi-sensory approach to education. So for example, I have a lesson in geography. So for the sight part of it, I could use a visual map. For the sound part of it, we could create a song which could help the children memorize the names of the cities or the states in that particular country. For the touch part of it, you could bring some props so that they can feel the props and they can touch it. Then for the taste and smell part of it, nowadays we are uh, online most of the places, uh, but when we get into the normal course of things, you could probably arrange for a class party kind of a thing. And you could tell your students to get a local item or a local dish, you know, which could be prepared by themselves with the help of their mothers. So that way, not only uh, would you would they learn more about the culture, about the history, about, uh, you know, the place itself, but at the same time, they would learn a whole lot of values about how helping, caring, sharing is so very important in life. So as far as possible, um, See, as teachers, I understand that these things are going to take some time, some extra effort at your end. But the icing on the cake, as I normally call it, is that whatever these students learn through all these tips, through all these methods, this will remain ingrained and embedded in their heads forever. And that's exactly what we as educators want from our kids. Let them experience, let them visualize, let them brainstorm, let them discuss, let them come up with certain things which they can think out of the box. So here, and I think the role of the teacher, if I were to put it down in a few points, a teacher can lend artistic and realistic touch to the story. She can lend an air of dramatization to the story. Uh, please make sure that you never skip the main parts of the story. In fact, you should also make sure that you select the story appropriately. When I say appropriately, it's not just about age appropriateness. I would also suggest that uh, when you're selecting a story, try to use a story which has a lot of dramatization so that you know you could uh, actually uh, keep the vivid imagination of the children keep going all the time throughout the so uh, story session. Now tell the story in an interesting manner with a whole lot of gestures, facial expression, voice modulation as I've just discussed with you. So uh, now we move on to the last section of my presentation and what I've done here is that I've taken up a few examples uh, wherein we could use storytelling and teaching in different subjects. So the first one is literature. Now here in what you could do is you could relate a classic story to a modern one. So for example, Clueless is a 90s take on Jane Austen's book called Emma. So you could ask them to you know, compare and contrast the two, that kind of a question could be put up. Then uh, you could have the students create a modern version of a classic story. I still remember the time when we as kids were very happy when we were given an opportunity to create modern Rah Mahabharata or modern Ramayana. You could do the same with uh, you know classic stories like Julius Caesar or Romeo and Juliet, for example. Now, uh, then 
have the students write the story from a different point of view, such as that of the antagonist. So uh, I think when uh, a lot of English teachers out there must be knowing that uh, sometime, some years back, we used to teach uh, the children a story on Julius Caesar, the assassination of Julius Caesar. And that entire story was almost from the perspective of Antony. So what if we were to ask the students to give the same story from the point of view of, say, Brutus? So that would again give them a chance to, you know, kind of brainstorm and come up with something new and would keep them engaged. Now, as far as writing is concerned, I think as a teacher, as a communication skills coach, I also feel that a whole lot of students find it very difficult to put down things in writing, especially if it comes to technical questions like writing a letter to the principal or writing a letter to the editor. So what you can do here is that, uh, I mean, obviously you cannot directly write a story in when you're writing a letter to the editor or to the principal, but yes, you can establish the context for the assignment through a story. So you could set, say, a persuasive letter writing scenario of trying to convince the principal to allow for more recess time. So this is how uh, storytelling can help you there in setting the context. Now coming to grammar. Now, when you are talking of grammar, let us introduce each part of speech as a character. So as we have eight parts of speech, you could you have you know a story revolving about, around these eight characters. So I've just taken up an example of two characters, the noun and the verb, are friends who never go anywhere without each other. And that's how you could start off with your story. Science. Now, this is something which I had recently, uh, you know, kind of uh, got to understand in one of the webinars. So I have taken it up from one of my co-educators. And uh, how does this go? I found it very interesting and I so decided to make it a part of my presentation as well. Uh, I think we a whole lot of our students who are especially in class 10 find it difficult to memorize the first 30 elements of the periodic table. So what we can do here is that we can involve them in a storytelling exercise. Now, this story is a very mini kind of a story, first of all. Secondly, the story is making use of mnemonics. Third thing, this story is also, you know, kind of uh, making use of a dialogue, a dialogue between uh, two or three friends, as you can see in the picture. So we have three friends in a classroom, Magalsi, Labib, and Arka. So Magalsi, as in magnesium, aluminum, silicon. Labib as in lithium, beryllium, boron, and Arca as in argon, potassium, and calcium. Now, what happens here is Magalsi one fine day enters into the classroom and she says, Hey ha, Labib. Now, hey ha is a kind or ha he is a kind of greeting. Okay. So ha he labib. So ha he as in hydrogen and helium, labib, lithium, beryllium, boron. And then she is finding the day very boring. So she says, see, no fun. So C as in C for carbon, no, N, O, N separately nitrogen, O separately oxygen, no fun. Fun as in, uh, you know, starting with F. So we have fluorine there. And to this, Labib, who is equally disinterested in the class because he's also finding it every, uh, you know, it's, he's finding the day very boring. He says, ne, na. So it's like nena, obviously, even I'm finding it boring. So nena would be neon and sodium. And then he says, Megalsi, he tells his friend, Megalsi, please call Arika. So please, as in P, S, please, phosphorus, S, sulfur, chlorine. Arika, we already know argon, potassium, calcium. And there is some news that he wants to break to Arkan. And what is that news? School time. So school, SC standing for school, and uh, it also reminds me of scandium, T, I, titanium, school time, Vikramin. So probably there's another boy in class called Vikramin. So V as in vanadium, chromium, and then manganese. Fell, for fell, we have Fe, which is standing for iron, into a coat, coat as in CO, cobalt, a coat of nickel, copper, and zinc. So this is how you can easily make your students memorize the periodic table. So these are the first 30 elements of periodic table. And once they're done with these, I think for 10 standard students, this much is really sufficient. So having said this, let's move on to our next episode here. So another thing that you could do is that uh, we normally teach our students that CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons are the ones that lead to the depletion of the ozone layer. So uh, you could create a story around CFCs, so as you can see here, there is a bad guy army. These are the bad guys. They have an army. This is the army of CFCs versus 
G1. And this I have picked up from the movie Ravan. So obviously, uh, most of the students must have watched this movie. So they can easily relate to this good guy and how this good guy finally fights this, these CFCs to save the Earth from uh, you know, uh, getting the Earth getting depleted of the ozone layer depletion. So this is another idea wherein you could create a story around this. And this is another book that I came across. Uh, this is again the story of Dandi March. And I have found this uh, really, really interesting. This is a storybook which has been written by Sandhya Rao. And I'll just quickly read up a few lines from here to give you a whiff as to how the story of Dandi March has been so well portrayed in the storybook. So in 1857, Indians fought the first war of independence against the British. They were brave, but they were defeated. Nearly 75 years later, Indians fought a very different kind of battle and they won. Their leader was Mahatma Gandhi. All he said was, give us our salt. On January 31, 1930, Gandhiji himself found himself writing a letter to the Viceroy, Lord Irwin. The Viceroy was the British monarch's representative in India. Dear friend, Gandhiji began, he was always polite even to the people whom he did not agree with. He was writing on behalf of the Indian people. He pointed out many unjust things that the British were doing. One of them concerned salt. Salt, as you know, comes from sea water. Since India is surrounded by sea on three sides, even the poorest of people who cannot afford anything else can make their food tasty by adding salt to it. But the British, they had their own ideas. They took control of the entire set of salt factories and salt pans in the country. Indians could no longer make their own salt. They were forced to buy from the British. Now, this is just an excerpt from this entire storybook. But what I also liked about the storybook was that it also integrated other forms of art here. So the children, as uh, you know, as and when they go through the story, they are required to, you know, color this up. And this clearly shows this uh, entire route from the Sabarmati Ashram, Anand, Jambusar, and then finally the Dandi Beach where the salt law was broken. And now these are heaps of salt so that you can see here. So this gives them an idea as to how long this march took place and what was the distance like and what were the surroundings like. So it gives them a fairly good idea as to what exactly happened, how Gandhiji and his followers went from Sabarmati Ashram in Ahmedabad to Dandi. And then there are these whole lot of other activities also in the book, like creation of posters or creation of slogans. And then you can see some more pictures there. The marchers set out from the ashram, a village which was all dressed up to greet Gandhiji, crossing the Mahi River. And finally, Gandhiji picks up a lump of salt from the Arabian Sea and breaks the salt law. And you can see the people here, you know, they are very happy uh, and, and they're very happy about their victory. So there is a sense of victory, which even the students will experience if you tell the story very effectively to them. So this is about the story of Dandi March. And then while teaching through stories, I think these are a few things that you need to keep in mind. You should make it very simple. As I said, you must deconstruct the complex portions and uh, you know convert them into nuggets, which are easy for them to remember and recall. Think of the end first. Think of the key takeaways first before you start with the story. Use props to send, you know, appeal the senses of your audiences, of your students. Set the scene or the context. Develop relatable characters. Avoid detours and distractions. And finally, you could tell your students to retell or paraphrase the story. That's the easiest thing you can do. If, even if you can't think of any other assignment, this is the least that we could do, right? So uh, having said this, I come to my concluding statement. Stories happen. And they are told because of the engaging worth that they generate. So that's a very effective statement about storytelling. And with that, I would like to thank each one of you who's present here live with us uh, for being so participative, for being so patient, for being so interactive. I would also like to thank uh, Karthik, Team Center, and you who's there in the background for this opportunity and for helping me share my experiences, my, uh, you know, for sharing my skills and my uh, knowledge with the other co-educators out there. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to, first of all, stop sharing my screen and uh, then we'll come back. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, 
superb 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 session i i don't think we could have made a better start to this year i mean uh, this, Thank you this, so this much. is uh, this was brilliant i mean i usually do a time check when it you know when it's 555 but i didn't really want to stop the flow because <laughs> it was it was going on so well and uh, so don't be surprised if i like text you next month asking you know uh, to do a session for us it again. will be my <laughs> pleasure i'll be overwhelmed this is really uh, i mean it, i can right now i can see all the comments and so much of love pouring in from all sections it's really it really means a lot yeah sure yeah. and uh, so so uh, so so we are already 10 minutes past 6 but i think if you're fine with it ma'am we can just sit, spend maybe yeah, the next yeah i think uh, the first question that i can see is that someone is asking yeah. me i think um, a teacher here was asking me this i think went up she was asking me to give the name of the author as to mm -hmm. the yeah. story of the bandi march so i'll just repeat it for the people out there it's sandhya rao the story was by sandhya rao so that was one thing that now you can go ahead and ask Sure. So there were uh, three questions which I came across. Of course, you know we'll we'll have a few more questions coming in. Uh, so the first question which I saw was from Miss Chitra Rola, and Chitra Ma'am was asking, what should be the ideal duration of a story of a story if it's for elementary school kids? What should be the ideal duration of a story? See, normally what I have seen across schools is that when we take a story, it has to wrap up within one period, and an average one period is approximately thirty minutes for primary wing schools. So. I don't think it should go beyond that, but yes, 30 minutes is required because you'll have to keep repeating it also again and again. That's exactly the reason why our teachers keep saying A for apple, B for boy, C for cat. So that repetition is very important. So I think uh, 30 minutes is sufficient, but during the 30 minutes, you probably require the same story to be repeated twice or thrice. So that would boil down to say like 10 to 15 minutes because it should not be very long because young kids they have a very small. Why just young kids? i think even we as adults or the younger kids or the elder kids each one of us has a very short time you know attention span these days uh, karthik you'd be surprised to know uh, i was just going through uh, you know some kind of a webinar and what they told us here was that uh, initially when we were since we are the byproducts of what is called the analog world our attention span when we were kids was around 20 minutes and these days the child's attention span is a minimum or you know just a maximum of 3 and a half minutes so you have to keep them engrossed so the stories don't have to be very long but yes you will have to repeat them twice or thrice for a student so that would make it a total of 30 minutes sure so uh, so the next question builds a little bit on that and it's from ms shraddha and shraddha ma'am was asking uh, given that there's so much pressure to finish syllabus on time and you know rush through lessons how feasible is it to always resort to you know the approach no. of sorry uh, that's the that's the major limitation see uh, there yeah. are a whole lot of benefits but there are primarily two limitations to storytelling as a method i'll be very frank on this number one you cannot always resort to storytelling this is one of the tools that you know you can use it to teach some complex topics you mm -hmm. can use it to engage your primary wing students so there are uh, you know situations and scenarios wherein you can use storytelling so therein you have to use your uh, you know mental faculty to understand as to how much time do i have to resort to storytelling because mind you it takes a little bit of time but as i said the benefit is that ultimately the principles remain ingrained there so it's not just storytelling in fact when we are taught in b ed it's not just storytelling there are n number of other methods also we use the case study method also so try to come up with different approaches this is just one approach just one method of uh, you know pedagogical teaching so you could come up with different kinds of uh, you know things which could cater to the multi sensory uh, faculties of your students so just uh, don't take this and second uh, limitation of storytelling is not everyone is good at storytelling as a teacher so first of all we as educators need to hone our story telling abilities and skills that's why i started off by saying it is part imperative that we as educators first of all continuously upskill upscale and upgrade ourselves only then can we take up this so these are two basic limitations of storytelling so we need to first work on them hmm. sure sure Uh, so there was another question from Ms. Poonam Mamdapur, and Poonam was asking, uh, uh, while someone say uh, you know uh, reading out a story to a four or five year old kid, is it always important to have pictures in that story, or are the kids' minds developed enough to you know imagine? No, I I, I think yeah. they respond better to pictures uh, sure. because this is not just from my experience. I mean, I'm talking as a mother, I'm talking as an educator. 
so i have had this whole lot of experience and i think uh, as i was just talking about this particular story book my first railway journey by mm-hmm. brunal mitra i had made a reference to the story you'd be surprised to know this story book does not have any words in it it's all about pictures and i i have actually got my own niece sitting with me and she enjoys the story it's how i te- narrate the story to her that's what makes the difference mm-hmm. but uh, if it would have been words she would have probably got lost in those words no so uh, i think for smaller kids if you have pictorial books and you create and weave the story around that that will be a better idea sure sure uh, nisha narsika ma'am is asking have you published any research paper in storytelling and i'm not saying, really uh, actually uh, <laughs> thank you so much uh, uh, but i haven't uh, published any research paper though i keep doing a lot of research work so i really was very pepped up for this session i did a lot of research work during this time but actually i've never got a research paper published but yes i have got myself certified for uh, storytelling skills i've got myself certified for uh, voice over artistry and the third one is uh, you know the presentation skills and communication skills by chris harrell now and you would be surprised to know all these skills that i have certified myself in was during the lockdown period that's why i don't call it the lockdown period it's more of a great pause period and for us it was not even the great pause period <laughs> this was the time to unlock down ourselves as educationists as educators absolutely absolutely really Really. Uh, so, Mr. Kanchan Kumar Das has a question, and it's an interesting one. And he's asking how to use storytelling for calculus and other higher mathematics chapters. Is that a possibility? Uh, okay. Uh, see, sir, actually, I'm not too much a uh, calculus of a person, but yes, I have uh, seen people using uh, stories and trigonometry. They use visual diagrams and they create real life situations. I think there is this one particular question. Since I'm not too much aware about the 11th and 12th math. but yes 10th math i'm teaching a lot of kids so what we can do there is this one particular question in rd sharma and it talks about uh, you know there is a peacock flying and there is a rat or a snake uh, sorry there's a peacock flying and there's a snake which is trying to get into its hole so there is this question in rd sharma it's all about trigonometry and then there is this question which talks about uh, uh, the cloud and its reflection so we do come across certain questions in mathematics which can be made into a story but uh, i'm really sorry sir but i wouldn't be able to help you with the story and calculus because i myself am not too much uh, you know into calculus and stuff so i think that kind of helps you know kind of answers your question sure so we'll take a couple of more questions one question yeah. is from as bindana tiwari and she's asking uh, could you please share something about autistic children and can uh, yeah bindana that's a lovely question and i think the repetitive text part that i was talking of is going to help the autistic children a lot i think that is my opinion that when we uh, keep repeating things for them and then we supplement them with a whole lot of gestures facial expressions our movements our eyes doing the talking but repetition is the key word because uh, the kind of that story mrs wishy washy now that's a predictable thing so after every 3 4 lines there will be mrs wishy washy mrs wishy washy mrs wishy washy so slowly and steadily these concepts get ingrained so i think for autistic children repetition and a whole lot of using melodrama using body gestures and obviously the predictable texts the predictable texts are going to be of great help uh i think we'll uh, this would be the last question and it's from mr tarun chobi sir tarun sir has of course been attending our, our sessions regularly thanks a lot for his support tarun sir uh, and he's asking how to use storytelling to convey a clear message and persuade someone to take action uh could you just repeat the question actually you got it like this uh, pilot uh, so it's and he's okay. asking how, how to, to story use storytelling to convey a clear message and persuade yeah. someone to take action so sir uh, i uh, i don't know whether you heard to that particular portion of my presentation where i wherein i was talking about uh, you know uh, using the narration of a real life anecdote the railway journey part of it and how we try to bring in that clear message to the student that how air pollution is caused and then we can ask students to think about it brainstorm about it and come up with solutions and similarly the plastic uh you know how it is a bane for us how uh, it is a non biodegradable substance and that message gets across clearly to the students and then they can come up with various alternatives so uh, these are a few things that we could probably do in order to ensure that students take action and i think when we put uh, i think the best part is that cliffhanger section 
so whenever you put your story to an abrupt ending somewhere in the middle and you ask the students to think about it they can believe you me they can come up with some great solutions even those kind of solutions which even we as adults cannot think of so i think this is uh, this is the manner in which you can you know actually it's a collaboration of two three techniques or tips that i had just presented during my presentation that you could make use of while conveying a clear message and trying to you know ensure and persuade students to take some action and similarly i gave an another another example of that grasshopper and ant thing when i was discussing about hibernation so uh, therein i had said that uh, you know you can ask students to understand the value of perseverance and that way you can you know bring in an analogy there and tell them this is why we keep telling you you should work hard and you should do well in your studies so you can draw analogies from your stories and you can you know uh, persuade them to take some action regarding whatever flaws they have sure. or whatever problems they are facing sure and there's a question i mean lots of teachers have asked uh, where did you get certified you know for storytelling and also voice over so they want to so all these to... courses are easily available online you could use i have been uh, you know getting certified through udemy and uh, we have i think we have coursera also which is there though i have never never used it but i've heard of it but udemy has been very good for me i have done all my courses from there from them and i'm already in the process of doing two more courses so i'm midway somewhere So Udemy offers a whole lot of good courses. So if you want to go ahead, just do it. And I think Senta in itself is doing a great job. I mean, every day there is this question coming up. You have to think as educators, and you have to keep coming up with a new idea each day. So there's this whole lot of opportunities that you find on Senta also. So these webinars again are a good example of you know learning from each other, cooperative learning. Thank you, thank you, thanks a lot, ma'am. Uh, really, really appreciate. That. uh thank you once again for for doing this session and as i said i'll be coming back to you for sure next month and i mean that i i could see that from the responses i mean we had i i think close to 1500 teachers attending the wow. session like so I'm really uh, cool, thank you so much everyone for taking and, and time sure, to schedule and i'm sure the teachers i mean uh, everyone loved the session and they're going to be sharing this you know with their uh, in the in their own networks with their uh, community of teachers uh so thank you once again for doing this and uh, thank you all uh, thank you uh, for attending this session uh the registrations for the next couple of sessions in the series are already open on my center the next session is going to happen on thursday uh, which is uh, uh which is 14th uh january and it's uh, it's it's actually going to be for hindi uh, primarily for hindi teachers but in case uh, i mean i'm i'm sure you will have a lot of practical takeaways if you uh teach other subjects as well so on, uh so it's on udaharan kaushal or the skill of examining as we call it so uh, that's that's going to be the theme of the session and again it's going uh, it's going to be facilitated by another really uh, special facilitator so the details are on my center you'd also have to receive notification via email so please check that out and register and also ask your friends and colleagues to register also more importantly uh, you know th uh, with your support we cro cross 5000 subscribers on youtube so please continue liking our video sharing uh, it, it in your networks and subscribing to our channel so we really really appreciate that thank you once again and i hope all of you have a wonderful wonderful evening ahead thank you thanks a lot thank you karthik thank you all thank you mom